someone asked me about the characteristic of the of the state of liberation and the use of it in life. I said, liberation is that which allows the individual to do what he wants to do and yet leaves him free from the binding influence. It will be very interesting to analyze this bondage and liberation, just at this point. Bondage is what? Hmm? Bondage is when the experiencer is not able to maintain his freedom. What happens when one sees a flower? Only the flower remains in his consciousness. What he is, who he is, this vanishes off. When one sees the table, only the table remains in consciousness. What he is, who he is, is eliminated. Hmm? This life, which does not leave the the subject, it only leaves the object, and the subject gets annihilated. This type of experience is binding to the subject. This binds the subject. That means the real nature of the subject or the real nature of the mind, which is bliss consciousness, that this consciousness is overshadowed by this matter. When only the matter dominates and the subject is annihilated, then life is called material. When the subject is not able to protect his existence and becomes overshadowed by the matter, when only matter dominates, then the subject is bound to the influence of matter, and that is material life, that is life in bondage. When this mind is capable of maintaining its bliss consciousness, even when it sees the table, then The subject is in freedom and the object is yet being perceived. So when the object and the subject both are maintained simultaneously, then the life is in freedom. Then one is out of bondage. Hmm? This is state of bondage where whatever we see that overshadows the real nature of the mind. Huh? The image of the flowers, beautiful blue flowers, the image passes through the retina and falls on the screen of the mind. The result is bliss consciousness, which is the nature of the mind, is overshadowed by this joy of the flower. Some little joy is gained and bliss consciousness is lost. Loss of a million dollars and gain profit of five dollars. Such a life is foolish. <laughs> to say the least of it, and this is the life in bondage, as if the matter, the object, binds the spirit. And when through meditation the mind becomes very familiar with the bliss consciousness, and the mind maintains bliss consciousness, 
even when the shadow of the image of this falls on that pure screen of bliss consciousness, this fails to overshadow bliss consciousness. The bliss consciousness is maintained, bringing freedom to the subject, and the object also is appreciated. This kind of life is said to be in freedom. And this is life in integration, that the hundred percent value of the object and hundred percent value of the subject both coexist. This is life in freedom. Otherwise, life in bondage. Life in bondage is material life. Only the matter dominates and the spirit is annihilated at this point. The question is, when the perception of the object overshadows the essential nature of the mind, what is the main thing that brings this about? The main thing is, the weakness of the mind to maintain itself. If the mind is weak and is not able to maintain its bliss consciousness when the image of this is falling on the mind, then it will be overshadowed. Hmm? So this overshadowing influence brought about by the perception of the object is not due to the perception of the object it is due to the weakness of the mind to maintain its subjective nature. Hmm? If it were due to the perception of the object, then in the state of cosmic consciousness, where the self is maintained all along and the perception always is intact, so the perception of the object is not responsible for the overshadowing of the real nature of the mind. It is the weakness of the mind that it can't maintain its structure, its bliss consciousness. And there is a law in nature, survival of the fittest. Survival of the fittest is the law of nature. And if the mind is weak, then the object will survive. It's <laughs> and if the mind is strong, it could allow the object to coexist along with it. Coexistence of the object and subject is in cosmic consciousness. Hmm? And the image of the flower falls to the retina on the nature of, on the screen of the mind. The screen of the mind is supposed to become identified with the flower. That means for any perception, identification is necessary that the mind becomes identified with the object. This, this is identification. Any perception results from identification. When the image of the object becomes identified with the screen of the mind. Now it is a different aspect whether the subject or the real nature of the mind is capable of maintaining its nature, bliss consciousness, or not. If it is capable of maintaining, then it is cosmic consciousness. If it is not capable of maintaining its real nature, then it falls into the bondage. 
but identification is responsible to give the experience. There has been a very wrong understanding about this word identification for the last many centuries in the field of metaphysics. Identification was supposed to be or was taken to be the cause of bondage. Identification was taken to be the cause of bondage. And when identification was understood in terms of bondage, then the philosophers came out to say, come on, don't identify yourself. This you must have heard that they warned you for being identified with what you are doing. So they asked you to maintain yourself, your awareness, when you are doing something. And this process of maintaining self-awareness was thought to be a process which will lead to enlightenment and liberation. Because if one is not able to maintain oneself, then one is bound, then one is identified. In order to be not identified, one should maintain one's awareness. And the teaching went on to plead, hmm, to advocate, mood making, maintaining the self. I am seeing the flower. Yes, I am seeing the flower and I am different from the flower. <laughs> I am seeing the table. Yes, yes, I am. <laughs> this kind of attempt to non-identification, attempt to n not allow ourselves to fall into the trap of identification, was supposed to be a practice for liberation. But this has only resulted in stress and strain. Many, many centuries, through many, many centuries, lots of philosophers have been advocating maintenance of self-awareness on the level of mood making. When I try to see the table and try to maintain my awareness, huh? awareness, pure awareness, we know from the practice of meditation, is not a thought. It is not an attitude. It is the state of consciousness. And when we try to maintain awareness on the level of thinking or mood making, then it is a thought, it is a mood, it is not the state of liberation, it's not pure awareness, it is self-deception. And self-deception of the type that will make us completely invalid for all practical purposes in life. Because if a practice goes on for six months or a year, that I want to maintain myself, and whatever I am speaking, I don't want to say. And whatever I am speaking, I don't want to identify. I don't want to be identified with my thought. Whatever I am speaking, I don't want to be identified with my speech. Whatever I am doing, I don't want to be identified with my doing. This kind of hide and seek. <laughs> can only result in dislocation of the coordination of the mind with the object. The coordination of the senses with the object which is responsible to give perception, to give experience. And when I'm opening the eyes and seeing the table and I'm feeling that I am maintaining myself, I am the fear, that gradually 
reduces the coordination between the senses and the object. And therefore, this process of maintaining the self on the level of thinking about the self, on the level of trying to be awake within myself when I am experiencing this, such a practice makes a man only impractical. Many professors in the colleges have said, hmm, those who followed the advice of Krishnamurti or some other advice, there have been in England, what is the name? Spensky and Gurdjieff. They advocated so much, their whole theme of teaching was round about this maintaining self-awareness. When in 1960, I was for the first time in England, I started to give lectures and people started to, to, to come from all the groups and for four or five days, a class of people came and what was that class? They would speak a word and wait. The speech was so much retarded <laughs> that after every word they want to pause for another word to come out and pause because they don't want to be identified with their speech. Whatever they are speaking, they must be a witness to that speech. When four or five days passed, and two, three such people visiting me every day, I asked someone, I said, what is this that you are doing? <laughs> you are saying a word and then pausing, and if I ask them a question, they'll sit like that, start saying one word after another. <laughs> I asked the man, tell me the secret about this, what is this all about? <laughs> and this was such a shock to him, he, he just as if uh, woke up and he said, is it not right? <laughs> All these people thought that they were talking to someone who would understand about this identification and here I am asking them, why are you retarded in your speech? <laughs> They said, we have been told to think before we speak. It's a wonderful lesson. <laughs> you must think before you speak. <laughs> huh? Look before you leave. <laughs> huh? It's natural. It's a beautiful teaching. But I said that the thought and speech they are so well coordinated. Right from birth we have been thinking and giving out expressions what we have to think. And such type of thinking may be justified between two thoughts. But what about this stopping between two words? <laughs> it was so ridiculous. Then I explained to them this principle of identification. They said, we are told to maintain awareness. That is, when I am speaking, I should not be lost. My awareness should not totally be lost in this speech. I must maintain my awareness. Then I said, this maintenance of awareness 
is not brought about on the level of thinking. This is thinking. When you want to stop a word and stop a word and stop a word. No. It is the spontaneous state of awareness which goes along with speech, which goes along with thinking, which goes along with action. Not that action has to be stopped or the steps of action have to be stopped in order to maintain awareness. This is thinking about awareness, making a mood of it. This is far from reality. The man was so impressed, he abandoned that group and started to meditate. And when he talked to the people that stop all this nonsense of self-awareness, because such an, such an awareness in the name of freedom has only brought retardation in efficiency. You can't think and talk fluently, you can't think and act fluently, it's just a retardation of, 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 of efficiency. And where there is retardation of efficiency, where is spirituality? Spirituality is the basis of all dynamic activity and it's not shunning activity, it's not getting out of activity. So, this identification has been so very, very widely misunderstood and misinterpreted in philosophical books. Having read some books, never try to go for it. It's just fooling ourselves. Pure awareness is a thing to be experienced and lived. And that we start living when we bring our mind to inner being and we start living it without thinking about it. Hmm? Just as thought of wealth or thought of bank does not help us in the market. So the thought of the self does not help us come out of the state of bondage. It is the state of self, the state of being or the state of pure consciousness which we develop in the very nature of the mind through the regular practice of meditation that helps us to live enlightenment, to live freedom in life. So, freedom in life has nothing to do with restricting activity. No. Actually, the real, substantial freedom in life means whatever is our, our undertaking in the field of thought, speech and action, we are never out of our awareness. The mind has gained such intimate familiarity with pure awareness that it is never out of it, whether in the waking or dreaming or sleeping in whatever state. That is the real state of freedom. So this is the story of freedom and bondage.